Heavenly Father God, we just thank you once again for this day that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the uh, children and the wonderful program they did. We thank you for their service to you, our Lord and our Savior and our King. May they live their lives, serve you always, God. And God, we lift up now our pastor as he uh, preaches from your word, God. May we feel your presence. May we feel your spirit. But most of all, may we worship you at this moment and respond, Lord, at the uh, uh, time, Lord. And we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I had to move a few things up here or else I'll trip over it. Um, I, you know, preachers have a trouble preaching short sermons, and so I don't call it a sermon. I call it a sermonette. So it's just, I promise it's going to be short. I know what time it is. And if I, I usually preach like 40, 45 minutes, and you don't want to be here. Uh, I know the Bengals game is at four, but I don't want to keep you that long, right? Um, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read the first seven verses, and it should sound familiar to you. You should recognize it in, um, in, in this Christmas season. So Isaiah chapter 9. If you don't have your Bibles, we should have it up here, and it does look like I adjusted it so you could see it through that. Good job, Aiden. He's doing it in the back. This is what it says here in God's word. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them, light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramp, tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray one more time. Lord, we thank you for the child that was born to us so many years ago. The child that did not stay a child but grew up to conquer to defeat sin, to defeat death, and to give us life. It is in him that we praise your name. It is in him that we are gathered here together today. It is in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray this. Amen. Today, as we look at this passage, we're going to spend a brief time here, but what's important here is this child that we speak of. The, the child that, this is a doll. I want you to know it's not a real child, right? We've used real children in the past, not, not today. And, and here's, a, here's a situation. This child that was born, Christ, who we read about here, you see a stark difference when it mentions him, right? When, look, look really quick at verses 1 through 5. It's so doom and gloom. It's, it's like, what does this have to do with Christmas? And then all of a sudden, verse 6 comes into the in there and it says for to us a child is born and all of a sudden you realize that's our hope the Christ child that was born in the manger the Christ child that was born in this Bethlehem this small little town that is our hope it says there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish that is because Christ has given us some great freedoms here there's no gloom for us because, firstly, you are promised freedom from darkness. It says that. It says 
in verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The world around us, the world out there is a dark place. I have four kids, and it, sometimes it troubles me to know the kind of world that they're growing up in. And it's getting worse and worse each day. And I could see it every day getting terrible. And I, I fear sometimes, I fear for the future that our kids have to live in. But there is a great light out there as well. And that great light that we have is in Christ. In fact, this same saying, the same verse is quoted in Matthew 4, 12 through 17 at the very start of Jesus' ministry. That the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light shone. If that's not the picture of first century Judah or 21st century America, the great darkness that we live in, there is a light, there is hope. That is what Christmas is about, is that light that has come to earth. And now when you are a Christian and Christ resides in you, you are that light in the world. So we fear not, as the angels say to the shepherds, fear not, because we don't have to fear for the future, because God has given us a great light Salvation to all people, coming from that little child that was born in Bethlehem, coming from what he did on the cross, that light is now within you as long as you are Christ, as long as you are a Christian. You are also promised in this passage, you are promised freedom from oppression. In Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve sinned for the first time in the garden, everything looks dim. It's dark, as I said earlier, and these people that just, these, the first man and woman committed a sin in front of God for the first time, and the punishment is severe. However, in Genesis 3.15, they're given hope, because Christmas is about hope, and they're given hope in the form of a promised offspring. It says that Eve's offspring will crush the head of the serpent. He'll crush it. We don't see this, again, for thousands of years to come to fruition until Christ is upon the cross and he dies and then he's resurrected three days later and we see that he defeated Satan in sin on the cross, that he crushed the serpent's head when he came back to life in the grave and now you, all of you in here and myself, and the world around us is given a choice to follow him or not. The most important choice you'll ever have in the world. We are all in bondage to something. We are all held slave to something in our lives. Some sin that is holding us back from following Christ. Yet here we see that he can break that bondage in verse 4 as on the day of Midian. As on the day when Gideon in, in, in Judges 7 conquered and won, he can take the small, insignificant army of Gideon and conquer sin, and now he can take you and have victory over that same sin that holds you back. God can break you of that bondage. I've seen it in people's lives, in fact. I have friends and, and, and family who have struggled with uh, sin and addiction and, and issues like that, alcoholism, and I've seen how Christ can come into their life and change them just like that. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what is happening in your life, but I know this. Whatever problem you have, whatever reservation you have about following Christ, God can stop that. He can break your bondage to whatever is holding you back. He can bring you closer to him. And it all starts with you taking that first step of saying yes to Jesus. Taking that first step to seeing not just the baby in the manger, but the, the king that was hanging on the cross for your sake so you can have life. He then goes into verse 5 saying that there is rest for the warrior, that the, the boot of the tramping warrior and the garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. There's no more fighting, no more war. 
There's no more pain or suffering because when Christ's kingdom comes, what we have is peace. He's the prince of peace, as we see later on. And this peace transcends all understanding, as Philippians 4 says. You are promised freedom from darkness. You're promised freedom from oppression. And here is the last point, and I told you I was going to be quick, so you better believe it. The last point is this. You are given freedom through Christ alone. You hear that? It's nothing else. This freedom, the peace, the hope that you have in this world doesn't come from any other source ever in this world. I know we're political people in America, and we, we love our politics, and we look at the president, and we think that he's going to change our life. I have bad news for you. It's not going to change anything. I don't care if you voted for Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Can I just say that? I really don't. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything. What changes something is Christ. And so our hope, our life, should be dependent on him, on Jesus Christ. Yes, I think you should vote. Yes, I think you should vote for people who support biblical causes and biblical foundations. But at the same time, don't put your hope in that person. Put it in Jesus. Put it in God. He is the only one that could give you true freedom from darkness, true freedom from oppression, from all those things that hold you back. Those things are rotting away in your soul. Christ can redeem that. He can save you from that. Because here, through Christ, we see four different titles for him. Four different names, right? We see first, wonderful counselor. A counselor is very simply someone who's there to listen, someone here, there to give advice, to talk to. God is there. Christ is there with you. He's not distant from you. He's not unrelatable to you. He doesn't, he doesn't just sit back and let you live your life and not care at all. You are precious to him, and he wants to be involved in your life. I'm a father. Many of you may be fathers or mothers in here. I know that every one of you has a father and mother because you're here. I have a great relationship with my dad. And my mom, of course, but my dad especially. There's something special, I think, and, and JC can attest to this, something special between a son and a dad, isn't there? And, and just to spend time with my dad and to talk to him and to, to call him on the phone almost every day and just chat about life and get advice. I get a lot of advice, and I vent a lot. And, and I just talk about all sorts of things like, like, you won't believe what Daryl said to me today. Like, I, no, I just, I'm joking. But, but you know, I, I like to spend time with him because my father is close. He is, he is there for me. He is present. He's not physically next to me sometimes. He's far away from me, but I'm able to talk to him. And there's beauty in that. There's beauty in that, that, that closeness that we can have. Christ is the same. He's a wonderful counselor. He's close to you. He wants to hear you. And not just a wonderful counselor, but he's a mighty God. So whatever he says that he could do, he can actually do. In the moment, right there, right when you ask it. Because we know that he's not just present in our lives, but he is, as Romans 8.28 says, that he is, works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. He is mighty. He's able the next is that he's the everlasting father. He's love. He, we see that all throughout 1 John, that God is love. And what that means is simply this, that he cares and comforts his children. I am a very, I, I would say that in my household, I'll give you a glimpse into our household. I'm the disciplinarian, right? I'm the one that has to give timeouts and, and sometimes uh, ground them. And I have a few of them here looking at me like, what? why are you saying this? You know, and, and they get in trouble with me, right? And I get those dad eyes like, oh, boy, you messed up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I like to think they get scared of me, right? And, and they have a healthy fear of me. But at the same time, it's hard. It's hard to be that dad and to, to discipline your kids at times. 
And, and it's hard because I love them so much and I look at them and when they get all teary-eyed, boy, it's hard. And, um, and I'll tell you, I love my kids so much and, and God being an everlasting father, God being a perfect father, he loves us even more. Lastly, what we see, the fourth thing that he is, is a prince of peace. We talked about the, the turmoil, the darkness, the oppression in this world. And again, only through Christ. He is a prince of peace. He is salvation. He brings reconciliation and completeness to all people. All people who call upon the name of the Lord. And he freely gives peace that transcends all understanding. I can't emphasize this enough. Christmas is not about gifts or Santa Claus or little elves on the shelf or whatever else you guys do. Those traditions are wonderful. Do them, but don't miss out on what the real purpose is, and that's Christ. That's the Prince of Peace. He opposes darkness and oppression. He loves you so much that he looked upon you and your sin and said that I will come to earth to die in your place. And Christ mounted the cross, took a last breath, but death couldn't beat him. And so on the third day, he rose from that grave, and now he's seated in heaven, waiting for you to come to him. That is Jesus. Whatever you're struggling with in life, whatever sin that is, is riding away in your soul, Christ can save you from that. He can give you peace. Just go to him, and he can love you in the way that you deserve to be loved. And his reign on the throne of heaven will be eternal, as verse 7 says. And all he's doing is waiting for you. Christmas is not just about Santa Claus and candy canes and all of that. It's wonderful. It's a great time of year. It's a great time with family. But remember, Christmas is about Jesus Christ, him crucified, not just born, but him dying for your sake so that you can have life forever with him in his kingdom. Let's go ahead and pray, and we're going to continue on into the next part of our service. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the king that you are in heaven now. We thank you for the baby in the manger. We thank you for the child that grew up in wisdom and in statute, statutes. And God, we thank you for the man who mounted the cross, Jesus Christ, in our place, so that we can now have life with you. We thank you for that empty grave. We thank you for the gift of salvation. And we thank you for the people here who follow you and say that they are Christians, Christ followers. Let us take that title seriously, not as just a moniker to use, but as a real statement of what we believe, you are Lord of our lives. It is in you that we rest. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, this is a time now that we respond. And uh, are we going to do the Advent candle now? Okay, who's doing that? Bob? Oh, wonderful. Well, we're going to go ahead and light an Advent candle um, as part of our Advent time. And then we're going to also sing together Silent Night. Our time of response now is just meditating on who Jesus is. If you'd like to talk afterwards, we can talk. And, and I'll say a few words after Silent Night to dismiss us. And then also tell you what we have for the kids because it's special. So uh, the guys in the back have it all prepared and we're going to hand it out. And I think the ladies have some stuff as well for the kids who participate in this. So... Um, Let's go ahead and do the Advent reading now. Yeah.